and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, do you remember like after the great financial crisis and the Fed couldn't get the unemployment rate down, even with all the rate cuts, and people were talking about like, <laughs> A monetary policy is pushing on a string in this environment. You remember hearing that term a lot? You know what I remember? I remember people complaining about below target inflation know, for so many, crazy. many, many years and how the Fed, we couldn't figure out why the Fed wasn't able to push up prices. And now fast forward to, you know, 2023. We can't figure out why the Fed can't bring inflation under control. I don't want to insult like the various like brilliant economists and pundits out there. I never would. But I, I always found the complaints about like too low inflation to just be like hilarious as if that was I, I, I as if there was ever like a real problem that anyone in the world faced. But I do think it's interesting, like, you know, this pushing on a string narrative, everyone sort of assumed that, OK, maybe it's hard for the Fed to get unemployment down, but that if inflation were to accelerate, well, at least we know how to deal with that. Yeah. But at the same time, there was this weird sort of discrepancy or tension because the Fed couldn't figure out how to push down employment or push up prices at that time. But it seemed to do a reasonably good job of like intervening in markets. Yeah. And this was this was the chorus that you heard for so many years. The Fed is coming in and distorting the markets, which, you know, tacitly admits that they do have an impact there. Yeah, I think that's sort of like one thing that everyone agrees on, especially in the wake of you know the, the massive spasms in March 2020, and then of course also in the wake of the great financial crisis, the Fed is pretty good at stopping financial crises. <laughs> that when there's a run on some sort of bank, if it so chooses that like maybe the Fed can't get inflation at target when it plans. Maybe it can't get employment at maximum employment, but it can definitely stop bank runs. Well, the other thing I would say, and we should stop talking soon because <laughs> we get could, to our guests. Yeah, we could keep going forever. But I, I think people forget how much things have changed in yes. the span of, let's see, uh, like 14 or 15 years. Yes. Because I remember, you know, I remember writing about the corporate bond market and it was like, oh, maybe one day. The Fed will have to come in and bail out the corporate bond market. And that was the worst thing that could happen. That was like, I, I got so much pushback on that. And then lo and behold, 2022 happens and the Fed comes in and rescues not only the corporate bond market, but treasuries, munis, pretty much everything. And it's sort of an accepted state of affairs now. Right. And of course, this is one of the things we talked about in a recent episode, our live episode with uh, Lev Menand and Josh Younger. Anyway. Let's get right to it. Let's talk more about how the Fed has taken on these new powers, these new responsibilities, what it can do, what it can't do. We are going to be speaking with Gina Smilek, Fed reporter at the New York Times, also a former Bloomberger, a former colleague of us, and the author of the new book, Limitless, The Federal Reserve Takes on a New Age of Crisis, which I see is number one in the uh, Amazon money oh. and monetary policy category. Nice. Gina, thank you so much for uh, coming on Odd Lots. Yeah, thank you for having me. Congratulations on the new book. You know, I'm curious about the title because Limitless, and obviously we talk about like, okay, the, the these new powers that the Fed has taken on, both in the wake of the great financial crisis and also the COVID shock. And yet there do there does seem to be a limit on its actual dual mandate, as in, does it even have the tools to do like the two things, max employment and stable prices? that we think of as being the Fed's core mission. Yeah, so I think they're actually fairly interrelated. So the the title itself actually comes from something Chair Jerome Powell said during sort of the depths of the 2020 pandemic upheaval. Mm. You know, he was doing an interview with David Wessel at the Brookings Institution, and David asked him, you know, is there a limit to how much the Fed can do to sort of save all of these markets that are crashing? I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that was right. the gist of it. And he said effectively, you know, no, there's no limit. We can do, you know, as much of this as we need to within the confines of the law. And so I, that's that's where the title draws from. And I do think that's relatively accurate, you know, in the sense that these emergency powers that they use to save markets, like Tracy was just alluding to, very broad, yeah. very comprehensive, can be stretched in a lot of ways. And that's a lot of what I talk about in the book. But then at the same time, you know, when you're busily stretching those in all the ways that you're stretching them, it doesn't necessarily sort of guarantee a smooth on ra ramp back to solid growth and stable right. inflation when we get to the other side of a crisis. Mm. 
Maybe uh, just to go back in time a little bit, and this is one of the themes that emerged from our conversations with Josh Younger and Lev Menand, but this idea that the Fed's mandate and its role has really changed over time. Can you talk to us about, you know, what was the original conception of the Fed versus what it is today? Yeah, so I spend a huge amount of time on this in the book because I think it's just so interesting. And I think the upshot is basically the Fed as it is today is not the Fed as it was originally envisaged in 1913 when it was set up in basically any way. 1913 Fed was set up to be a really limited institution that was basically going to come in and prevent runs on the bank, which were a very frequent characteristic of society in that time. We had just had a bunch of big financial crises, including a very painful one in 1907 that caused a very bad recession. And so that was sort of the idea, is we need some sort of institution that can both sort of make money more organized and make sure that it's not getting stuck in Mm. Tallahassee when you need it in somewhere in the middle of Kentucky. And we need an institution that can make sure there's sort of a lender of last resort, somebody who can back up markets in times of crisis. So those emergency powers, always kind of there, very limited at the outset. The monetary policy power is really not hmm. there at the outset because we were, if, if you recall back, you know, we're on the gold standard. That sort of had some sort of self-breaking mechanism. We regularly drop the gold standard. So, I mean, it was not some cure-all solution for inflation, but just the, the way we thought about inflation in society, very different at the time. And, and the Fed didn't have such a developed role in sort of regulating the speed of the economy back then. Fed independence is a mm. term that you hear a lot. And I feel like it has different definitions and different contexts. But can you talk about like, where did this term come from and what did it mean? Like, what is this idea? What what, what was the purpose of it? What do people mean? And where did it, yeah, where did it originate from? Yeah. So we need to do a little bit more history here. So you get up through the 1930s and the Fed has really kind of figured out how to actually do some macroeconomic management. They sort of figure out that if you buy and sell bonds, it can guide interest rates into place. You can either speed up the economy in slow times or, or slow it down when you need to. And up into the 1950s, the Fed really starts to take on sort of this inflation management job. And What we see in the 1950s is the Truman administration is really leaning on the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates very low, to try and sort of buy bonds, use its its ability to print money effectively to help sort of fund war efforts, fund, you know, the fiscal fiscal policies that they want to do. And the Fed is very concerned about inflation. And so we see this real rebellion at the Fed where they work very hard to wrestle their wrestle control over their policies back. Mariner Eccles, who's one of the sort of, sort of important pivotal figures in early Fed history, actually ends up releasing an account of a very sort of tense meeting between the Truman administration and the FOMC mm. to the press. It embarrasses the administration. The administration decides to come to some sort of agreement with the Fed. And we get this 1951 Fed Treasury Accord, which really hands the Fed a lot of independence over monetary policy, a lot of ability to not necessarily set the targets itself, you know, it, it still has to aim for maximum employment and stable inflation as Congress eventually defines, but it does get to decide how it's going to go about those jobs, completely independent of the partisan process. So it's funny you're talking about this because um, I wrote about it and we talked a, a lot about it with Josh Younger on that episode about the origins of, of the shadow banking system and sort of the modern financial system as well. But just to back up slightly, when we talk about central bank independence nowadays, we generally talk about it as a good thing. And it's Mm. often considered a hallmark of a developed economy versus, say, in an emerging market with perhaps more institutional weakness where the central bank might be pressured to do whatever the government wants. Why is it desirable to have an independent Fed that is perhaps a little bit more free from the types of political considerations that you would see in elected politicians? Mm. Yeah, I think a huge part of the reason we treat it as sort of the gospel that it is, that Fed independence should be protected at all costs, traces back to the 1970s. So in the 1970s, we had an inflation situation not hugely unlike the one today, originally caused by some supply issues, some excess demand issues tied to war efforts, and it just lasted for years and years. And the Fed would occasionally raise rates to try and bring it back under control, but then when unemployment went up, they would quickly lower the rates again, and they just never got a handle on it. Historians, economic historians, think that part of the reason for that is Burns, then the Fed chair, 
was really caving to the Nixon administration. Nixon was very nervous about re-election. He wanted rates to stay low. Low rates translates to low unemployment. And so that was sort of the conceit. And it's pretty clear from tapes that were released after the fact that Burns, a huge Nixon loyalist, did in fact take that into consideration when Mm. setting monetary policy. And so the idea is you just don't want to have these short-term political considerations in place when you're doing something as important and potentially painful as fighting inflation because it could sway your decision making in a way that allows inflation to become sort of entrenched in the economy. And we really saw in that episode that it was very difficult to get inflation out once it had been so ingrained in economy. There was what people now refer to as this inflationary psychology that got just sort of really dug in and and took a big recession to wipe out. Let me sort of like zoom up a bit towards the present day, and I'm we're happy to go back like into the history because I, I think this is interesting. But one dynamic that feels real, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that one nice thing about the Fed is that it can sort of just move, and that there is like I think people have very low expectations for what Congress can do on anything these days. It's sort of like every once in a while you get a window where one party controls the White House and both houses of Congress, and then they have a limited political capital to spend. Whereas in theory, the Fed can just move very fast. And we saw that in the middle of March 2020, for example. How much of the sort of accumulation of powers that the Fed has, particularly over the last 15 years during a period of like deep partisan division, is simply a function of, well, it's one institution in D.C. that is not riven by partisan gridlock. Yeah. So I think this is sort of the central conceit of my book is we've built up all these powers over time, basically because they always made sense in the moment. And now we're using them all simultaneously because of the situation in Washington. And so I think, you know, everything we've talked about so far. So 1913, we're set up to guard against banking crises. 1930s, we really deepen those powers to guard against banking crises because that's the problem of the day. 1950s, the problem of the day is increasingly inflation. 1970s, that is the big problem. And so you have sort of the, these like ebbs and flows where everybody's focused, everyone at the Fed is focused on banking crises, then everyone at the Fed is focused on inflation. Suddenly we get to the modern era and everything is suddenly the Fed's job. You know, we're, we're very concerned with sort of the monetary policy management portion right. here, but we're also using them pretty aggressively to fend off financial crises and moments of financial crises. And I think a lot of the reason for that is because some of the things that they can do in moments of financial crisis are a lot easier than coming to some sort of agreement on Mm -hmm. Capitol Hill on either A, bank regulation that might preempt some of those financial problems, or B, some sort of, you know, bailout for the institutions that are a problem. So it's a small miracle whenever Congress manages (laughs) to pass a law, and yet the Fed can announce like a trillion dollar program, it seems almost overnight. Why is that? Talk to us a little bit more about the process and what limitations, if any, there actually are. I guess the the, the clue is in the name of your book, Limitless, but if there are limitations or constraints in what the Fed can do. Yeah, so there are some limitations, but I think that they're actually often exaggerated even by the experts who Mm -hmm. know a lot about this. So in moments of extreme crisis, the Fed basically has to get a declaration that we are in an unusual and exigent circumstance. Mm -hmm. And it then has to get sign off from the Treasury Secretary in order to set up an emergency lending facility to help an organization or entity. The facility has to be broad based, which lawyers generally mean think means about five institutions would have to be able to tap it. Hmm. And the Fed has to be secured to its satisfaction, which means that it can't expect to lose money depending on whatever it's defining as its satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Most lawyers at the Fed will tell you that this means they can't lose money. Lawyers outside the Fed will say that's kind of dicey. We're not actually sure that that's true. I mean, that has always seemed to be really fluid because I remember post 2008 when the Fed was doing one of its bond buying programs. Oh, it was buying mortgage backed securities, MBS. And it said it was only buying investment grade MBS. And I remember looking up each individual QCIP for like a week and seeing that some of it wasn't investment grade when the Fed bought it. But it didn't seem that 
concerned with that aspect of the program. Yeah, that's and that was actually technically QE, but I think the same basic rules apply mm. with these emergency lending facilities. They really are pretty broad, though. There's So I think a really interesting example here that comes up a lot is there was this one program with the nerdiest name of all time, I think because nobody wants to talk about it. But it's the term asset loan facility. And basically what it does is it buys like it takes on, on as collateral bundled TAF. loans. I remember TAF. Yeah. Yeah. And so t- we, we used it twice. We used it in 2008. We used it again in 2020. The 2008 version was collateralized by the private sector. The Fed didn't have any government money backing hmm. that up. And that's always sort of the idea is that, oh, well, there's some constraints in here because Congress has to appropriate some money to like back up these facilities. That's clearly not technically true based on the way we've actually done this in the past. Hmm. And so I think there are fewer limits than maybe we we appreciate. But the one thing that does seem to be a real limit is the Fed doesn't really have a way of just like giving households buying power, which of course was a really powerful aspect, it would seem, of the the V-shaped recovery we saw coming out of 2020. It was probably a big aspect of the very slow recovery we saw out of 2009, the very modest fiscal stimulus, especially in retrospect, not even a trillion from the Obama administration. And it feels like a lot of the frustration that people have towards the Fed is that it does, on some sense, seem to be limitless designing these new programs. But actually, the one thing that might actually move the dial big time or meaningfully from a macro perspective, give people money. That's still like the one thing they don't really have any way of doing. Right. Lending, not spending is right. sort mm. of the phrase j Powell repeats ad nauseum. They can lend. They cannot spend. You can do lending in ways that look a little mm-hmm. bit like spending. You know, I think we saw some some push to do that during the depths of 2020. Like there were some ideas about making loans to municipalities mm. really long term and really right. low rate. And we didn't actually see them take up that up too much. I think they still very much see themselves as backstop entities who mm-hmm. shouldn't be used in that way because it's just too close to fiscal policy. <clears throat> but again, I think that's more of a personnel choice that's being made versus something that is like necessarily legally extremely required, which I think is an interesting thing to talk about. And I think that, you know, the the interesting thing to watch is how are these programs used in the future? You know, will they continue Mm. to see them as this backstop? Do they think this fiscal separation is very important? So just on that topic, I mean, one of the things that you will sometimes hear people in markets talk about is this idea of the Fed getting bang for its buck. And I guess it was most salient maybe with the corporate bond buying program where they announced, you know, we could spend this much buying up corporate bonds to stabilize the market. But in practice, I think I can't even remember the exact number. You might know it, but it it was a fraction of the announced amount that they could do. And just by virtue of saying that they were going to backstop the market, they brought in credit spreads very, very dramatically. Is that always going to be the case? Or is there a possibility that as the Fed takes on more and more responsibilities and if it maybe has to use these things over and over again, that sort of firepower starts to dissipate? I think this is such an interesting question, and I do not pretend to be enough of an expert at markets to have a great answer to it, but I've talked to a lot of people about this, and I think you actually get a range of opinions. Mm. There are some people who say, you know, they're such a credible lender of last resort that this is basically going to stay this way, that, you know, we people people it'll work them. forever yeah people believe them i think other people will sometimes point you towards some of the treasury market dysfunction that we saw really early in the crisis where it didn't seem like people were being completely reassured and i actually think that's an interesting distinction because I think that speaks to sort of market fragmentation. You know, it, just to sort of, sort of rewind the tape here, back in 2020, people were dumping treasuries. It wasn't like one or two entities, and they weren't necessarily all U.S.-based mm. dumping treasuries. It was everybody. It was hedge funds who had basis trades on. It was a lot of international holders. A lot right. of the selling was coming out of like the Cayman Islands. And so I think there was this real sort of signal problem where the Fed might be stepping up. You might be pretty familiar with what the Fed's doing, but there was this idea like, you know, how aggressively are they going to do this? Can we trust them? You know, there's so many entities having trouble coordinating at the same time. And so I do think those market structure issues kind of do matter because Fed efficacy could be different if market structure changes and becomes more fragmented. Hmm. I want to get back actually to the Muni backstop that we saw in 2020, which was like a pretty novel, you know, further extending of the power, kind of a, a novel policy intervention. And one of these areas that did seem to like, is this fiscal policy, is it monetary policy? 
it's kind of fiscal if you're allowing fiscal authorities to spend money, you know, for uh, in obvious ways. But the question I have is like, when they're thinking about, well, where is the boundary? Where's the border between what monetary versus lending? Do they like, and I've asked this question to others and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Do they think about where they want to go and then backfill the legal justification? Or do they look at the law and then determine how far the law allows them to go? Yeah, so I think we've seen that vary somewhat by crisis. Mm. Um, I think in 2008, I would say it was definitely the latter. And I actually think that's pretty well documented at this point. Like, I think if you read like the more recent Bernanke mm -hmm. book, for example, I think that pretty clearly. They took very seriously, yeah. very seriously this idea that there were things they might have wanted to do that they couldn't. Well, they knew they knew what had to happen, right? Okay. Like, I think they like they knew what had to happen, and they were really trying to figure out how they could accomplish that within the confines of their own legal mandate. Got it. I think that in 2020, it was some combination of they knew what they were capable of based on the 2008 experience, and they were kind of looking for places that you might need to build on that, given the sort mm. of unique circumstance that was 2020. The municipal program, though, that you mentioned, I think was a particularly interesting example because they had literally said for basically years at that point that they were not going to do municipal bonds. Right. That, like, so similar to what you said about the corporate bonds, Tracy, yeah. they had been very clear that this was not a market. Right. They it was to like jump into. crossing a Rubicon that they didn't want to do, and I think they explicitly said that at some point. Yeah, Rashida Tlaib asked them about it, freshman Democrat asked Powell about it on the Hill in 2019. And he was basically like, we don't have this power, nor do we want this power. <laughs> and then kind of, you know, very interestingly, April 9th, 2020, and they, they you know, jumped, jumped right into that market. You know, the municipal bond market was in shambles yeah. when they jumped in. It was mm -hmm. really bad. People were really struggling to issue states and localities. Like the CARES Act has just passed. We're not sure if it's enough money. States and localities really need money because the pandemic's onset. You know, there it was a tough moment. And so I think that it's not a surprise that they saw the need, but it was interesting that they thought they could fulfill it. Hmm. Well, it definitely reminded me at the time of um, the ECB's OMT program where mm. the, the ECB said for years, we can't lend to member states, we can't <laughs> lend to member states. And then when things are really falling apart, they're like, well, we can. And the reason we can is because if member states don't have a borrowing capacity, then we can't really fulfill our monetary mission. So you it's sort of like backfill in a new power based on the law just because they kind of realized that the existing thing was untenable. When the facts change, I right. change my <laughs> mind or whatever that quote was. Um, but, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is the sort of mixing or maybe overlap between monetary policy and fiscal. And so I want to ask a devil's advocate question, and I, I want to make very clear that this is a devil's advocate question. But, you know, why couldn't we have a situation where if Congress is gridlocked and politicians can't do anything, for instance, with the debt ceiling. Why couldn't we have the Fed say that it is going to support a particular thing or mandate? Like maybe they want to finance a bunch of renewable energy or maybe they want to finance a lot of infrastructure or something like that. Why Why would that be bad? Yeah. So I think that there are some people who think that that would actually be great and we should do it. And, you know, we have this amazing tool at our, at our disposal and why shouldn't we use it, basically? And that is that is one argument. I think there's another side of this story that basically says you wouldn't want to do that because if the Fed is seen as a really partisan actor, if they're doing things that one side of the aisle really feels strongly mm. shouldn't be happening, you could see a situation where... A, they face a lot of backlash on the Hill that eventually results in them losing this prized independence that we've just talked about. Or you could see a situation where they're just sort of less trusted as an entity. And these are a bunch of unelected officials, right? Like right. Their, their sort of mandate, whatever legitimacy they have in our democratic system kind of ties back to this idea that they're honest brokers, nonpartisan, trying to be center of the aisle. Joe's face when I was asking that question, by the way, I could tell that you were waiting for me to ask about the trillion dollar coin. Yeah, because you said debt ceiling. And so I was like, I got really excited. Boy, all right, but, so let's, but wait, let's, wait, wait. I would just say Gina's response yeah. there. This is the reason why I think the trillion dollar coin is actually <laughs> problematic because it's one thing to say like, well, I agree with them doing it this time. But what about the next actor that comes in? Yeah. You know, you might not necessarily agree with it then. Yeah, I meant another one. But <laughs> all right, we're going to actually, we're going to put a parenthetical at this part of the conversation. At any point in the researching of your book, did you glean any insight into whether the Fed would accept a trillion dollar <laughs> platinum coin? Did this come up at all in your research? 
No, oh. it did not. <laughs> okay. It did not. And I will say, I've I've spent a lot of time recently rereading all of the old transcripts yeah. around debt limit. I don't think, I don't think there's going to be a lot of appetite over there. I'm I'm sorry to yeah. tell you. Well, when when the alternative is blowing up the economy, as we know, suddenly Things change suddenly quickly. suddenly appetites change. But I do want to get back to actually. I mean, I thought Tracy's devil's advocate question wasn't really was pretty legitimate. And you know, there is this sort of. An argument you sometimes hear from certain types in D.C., I never totally bought into the logic, but I'm curious your take on it, which is that when the Fed does things like these extraordinary emergency measures in March 2020 or in 2009 or whatever, that it's kind of bailing out politicians and that the Fed should say, no, like if you want to have sound cities and states that don't have to lay off all your workers, get together and pass a law to bail out cities and states or whatever it is or even you heard this in you know some in just with rate policy in the mid 2010s where they're like no congress should be using fiscal tools and if we keep cutting rates that's mostly good for the stock market and the rich and mm-hmm. it's not really great and the fed should say we're not going to just cut rates because the congress won't do its job and pass more pro growth policies in your view like does that reverse feedback mechanism theoretically exist where if a theoretical fed chair wanted to say we are not going to do x because we want to force elected officials to do what elected officials should do could it play a role in preventing politicians from just sort of passing on these problems to this third party yeah you know i think it's a really interesting question i don't actually think that it has a simple answer partially Mm -hmm. because you just talked about a lot of different policies and sure sure, probably have different applications but also just because you know, I think that these I think that these issues are probably pretty case by case. Like mm-hmm. we're working with different Congresses, we're working with different policy tools. And I do think that that just makes things very messy. And I think actually one thing I tried to communicate in my book, which I think you can do pretty nicely in mm-hmm. a book in a way that you can't necessarily do in a news story or anywhere you have to be brief, is a lot of these choices are just really difficult. Like sometimes there are no good alternatives mm-hmm. if you're the Fed. Like What you're doing is going to enable some bad behavior by either a politician or a market actor. But if you don't do it, you risk some pretty serious problems. And I think there's no clear rubric sometimes. And I I think that's really interesting. And I actually think that's a good reason to talk about these kinds of responses after they happen and sort of plan for them in the future instead of waiting and making all of these decisions in a crisis. You know, I think it's I think to the extent that you can pre-plan for this stuff it could make it make those decisions a little bit less ad hoc when they're happening. Yeah. And it definitely feels like it's true that having had the experience of 2008, Mm. the Fed was better prepared or at least more willing to sort of roll out that emergency playbook in 2020, which was probably very helpful. Just going back to the idea of Fed independence versus sort of like efficiency and expediency, what should guardrails on the central bank's power actually look like? Yeah. So I distinctly did not take a position on this in this book because, you know, I don't think it's my job necessarily as a journalist. But I will say, I think, you know, you hear proposals from a range of experts who study this and do have opinions on it that I think are interesting to at least talk about. You know, there are some people who think that there shouldn't be guardrails and that you should actually make more ambitious use of this, that you should think more about how to use these policies expansively. There are some people who think that you should apply more of a sort of formulaic approach to these like there should be some sort of trigger for when you use market functioning mm. qe for example is is one thing i've heard as a proposal and then there are some people who think that there should just be more explicit coordination like something should trigger a moment of coordination between the fiscal authority and the fed in an even more coordinated way than just having a treasury sign off you know, for example, if the Fed is doing market functioning QE, the Treasury should immediately be involved in that. And so I think those are some of the things that you'll hear people say. I think that, like I said, I think this all just deserves a little bit more debate than maybe it's gotten in the wake of 2020 because these these tools are so powerful that it seems likely they're going to be used again. Well, you know, we're, we're recording this actually on uh, March 7th. And, you know, there was just a poll hearing on the Hill. And some of these questions, um, it was in front of the Senate, and some of these questions came up from both sides, but about like climate and the Fed and how the Fed thinks about uh, climate risk. And you have conservatives more saying like, why should the Fed be anywhere in the business of anything to do with climate? And then you have others who say, well, climate is a risk to the economy and there are various reasons why climate could take part. But again, I'm curious, sort of this broader question of 
how much does the Fed sort of, even on these very long sort of like non-acute things, become essentially this like sink where the all mm-hmm. these fights end up becoming yeah. Fed related because it's really hard to pass anything climate related or it's really hard to pass anything related to sort of like a racial justice uh, right now. So all of these things become Fed issues because we have so little hope that Congress can do anything about them. Yeah. And I think that they certainly have to some degree become Fed issues. We certainly yeah. talk about sort of racial wealth equality yeah. and we certainly talk about sort of the climate risks and climate finance in the context of the Fed. I think the interesting thing, and I think you kind of alluded it to it earlier, is that the Fed can't always do so much in these right. these domains. And so sometimes <clears throat> I think there is this risk that you have a false sense of security where you feel like, hey, the Fed is kind of on this and actually the Fed's tools are just poorly equipped to handle this. You know, it's interesting because for all of the expanded powers and the new er areas that they've gotten into with each crisis, there does seem to be a pretty deep conservatism. And I don't mean it in the right, right, left sense of just like a sort of institutional conservatism about just going back to like the dual mandate, like 2% inflation seems pretty sacrosanct. They post 2010, like, you know, this sort of, oh, six and a half unemployment. Is that full employment? Like uh, six and a half percent unemployment is pretty high, but you know, some early inclinations that maybe that would be enough. Why is that aspect of the Fed? You know, Janet Yellen, who I think many would consider to be a sort of dovish policymaker, never seemed to be particularly comfortable with the idea of like letting it run hot at the time. Why is that aspect one area in which you don't see a particular, like a lot of like a creativity about? Yeah. So On the inflation side of things, I think that we probably were headed in the direction of a little bit more creativity Mm. before this episode, actually. You know, they they did it and sort of changed their inflation target in the sense that they made it, they gave it a look back period. They made it an average over time. I think we're getting like pretty close to that with just like actually nudging it up a bit, but we didn't get there. They certainly didn't do that. But I, I do think that there was sort of like, you know, Not a thousand flowers were blooming, but a few more flowers were blooming Mm -hmm. when it came to the inflation target. On the employment side of things, I would say that they they are conservative in the sense that they still think about the world through a sort of very Phillips curve framework, meaning that there is some trade off between employment and inflation. But I think that they've become a lot more modest about their ability to understand that Phillips curve. Mm -hmm. And it's it's difficult to say they here because we're talking about like you know, 19 policymakers, and this applies to each of them a little bit differently. Some of them are still pretty devoted adherence to the idea that they can specify some sort of natural rate of unemployment. But I think a lot of them, and including the chair, importantly right mm-hmm. now, has become have become a lot more skeptical about the idea that you can like credibly predict how low unemployment can go without causing inflation at any given moment. And so I do think some of that conservatism has actually waned with time. Mm. Right. This episode obviously throws a big wrench into that. Right. I mean, you do get the sense from policymakers now they are more open about saying like, well, maybe there is something particularly about inflation that we are missing here. And I think we've had one or two people on the show who've talked openly about that. But this actually leads into something else I wanted to ask you, which is with that realization that perhaps there's something about the Phillips curve that's changed or that we don't fully understand as policymakers, and also with the evolution of the Fed's role in the financial system and markets, how do Fed officials themselves feel about this? Presumably you talk to current and former ones. How how do they you know explain it and how do they talk about it? Yeah. So I think a lot of times when you talk to Fed officials about this, you will hear some amount of concern, actually, that if you ask the Fed to do too much, it won't be able to do anything well. Mm. Um, so I do think that that is a thing that they're very attuned to. And that's not I mean, that's not a huge surprise. I think they kind of gave us some hints of that in sort of that 2015 hiking cycle that you were mm-hmm. even previously talking about when. Congress just wasn't passing anything to help the economy along. And, you know, you would hear Fed officials occasionally say that out loud. But I think after 2020, I think there was still some feeling that you just don't want to push too much on the Fed. Not everything should be the Fed's job. I do think when it comes to sort of the the framework and the how do you think about the economy in this brand new world, 
I think the you know the jury is just not out yet. They're they're still trying to figure out what went wrong in 2020 and 2021, and mm-hmm. they're still trying to figure out what's what's going wrong now because they don't seem to be getting this inflation under control as quickly as they had expected to. I think so. I think it's just a situation in flux. How much of the rapid movement, and it was like basically day after day in like early 2020, their ability to roll out these new programs. How much? easier was that because of scaffolding, basically, that was built in 2008 and 2009? And how much specifically the work of like Bernanke, working with Geithner, et cetera, enabled Powell and Mnuchin together to move as fast as they did? So I think that there, this, I'm actually going to give a two-part answer to okay. this. Part one is definitely the scaffold, scaffolding mattered a lot. A, they kind of had a pattern for how this could work. And B, they had some ability to not make the mistakes that happened in 2008. Like, For example, they kept better track of these programs and were very transparent about them. They like told us what they were buying, not at a five-year lag, but just immediately. And B, they got congressional backstop for every single one of the programs that mattered. Like Mm. it it wasn't like what I described earlier in 2008 when they used private sector money to set up the TALF. And I think the reason they did that is because they thought that there was some sort of democratic legitimacy to having that sort of, you know, Hmm. buy-in. Also, it's easier. It was like an easier setup. But I I do think the democratic legitimacy part mattered there. And so I think we learned a lot of lessons from 2008. Part B, though, I would say is while they learned a lot of lessons and the scaffolding mattered, they had to set up a bunch of new programs that they had never seen, never tried before, Mm -hmm. municipal, Main Street, lending, et cetera, et cetera. And I also think that they had really not been anticipating that they were ever going to have to use the 2008 programs again. For Mm -hmm. example, money market mutual fund program, that took ton of effort, a lot of late nights, a lot of huge scrambling to get set up because they just, money markets had changed so much in the interim and they hadn't really like been keeping up with it. Like they, there was no design ready to roll off the counter for this program. And Hmm. so it it did require a lot of last minute sort of legal, legal, you know, finessing. You know, looking forward, obviously there's always people complain about the Fed from every angle. That's not new. Years ago, you know, you've had the sort of like abolish the Fed types, Mm. audit the Fed types, various attacks on it from different angles. But it more or less like seems to operate. And by and large, I get the impression that politicians have other things to worry about that are, you know, that play better on TV than like, you know, uh, the arrangement of monetary policy. Do you perceive any change to the trajectory of the Fed, either your institutional setup I mean, it seems like this sustained period of high inflation, maybe not great for the Fed standing within politics within D.C., but do you see any like real threats or on the horizon to the sort of modus operandi of monetary policy in this country? Yeah. So I think actually, A, I think the sort of little C conservatism that you were talking about earlier helps them a little bit in this Mm -hmm. regard. I think when you're like boring when you just bore people to death. It makes them less (laughs) likely that they are going to come and meddle with your Federal Reserve Act. So I think that's useful. I do, and I talk about this a bit in the book, I do think that there are a couple of things we should pay attention to here, though. One of them is, I just think that the elected government has become so much more aware of what the Fed is capable of Mm. and what it can do with some of its powers, both the emergency lending powers and just bond buying, which has become much more passe than it used to be. And I think that you have to keep an eye on what kind of appointments are being made to the Fed's board in Washington. Mm. The board is so powerful. The board does so much of what the Fed does. And it's presidentially appointed people. And it turns over relatively quickly. They're very long terms, but people don't typically stay in them for the long terms. Hmm. And so you often have a situation where it's relatively politically lined up in one direction and it's got all these powers, can potentially have a partisan lean. And I just think that given how much power this institution has, that's something to be very aware of. And I think it's something to you know make sure elected officials are focused on appointing nonpartisans to the degree possible and feasible in a very partisan hmm. world. It is interesting talking about like the conservatism. Even the presidents of both parties seem to be conservative in their picks. Like other than Trump's failed nomination of Judy Shelton, most of his names were like pretty conventional. Okay, but I think you just can't. I feel like this is a thing that often happens in the media and we just pretend like the Judy Shelton nomination didn't happen and didn't (laughs) almost get confirmed, right? Like I think because there was was some really interesting picks there where they were like, 
just scrapped immediately. Like Steve Moore was not going yeah. to realistically get this job. I mean, I think it's highly likely at some point the culture wars come to the Fed. Yeah. And I mean, you've seen it in, with the ESG space and yeah. investing. Like it to me, it's just a matter of time. And the way they came for the Supreme Court, you know, right. I, I think we're in a place with the Fed that you, I think the Supreme Court is the right analogy to use. You know, it used to be treated in a very different way not by any sort of legal requirement, just because that's the way we thought about the court. Mm -hmm. And we're at that stage now where we treat the Fed a certain way, not because of any legal requirement, just because that's how we think about the Fed. And I think it's just a thing to be aware of. You wouldn't want this power to go partisan because it could go partisan in both ways. Can this I just exactly say- exactly my point. Yes, I totally agree. Can I just say, I, we have these monitors in the studio of like different TV networks. And I just saw Larry Kudlow on one of the screens. And I thought about like Fed governor Larry Kudlow one day. Nothing against Larry, but you know, it's like future, like, I don't know, probably not at this point, but it is sort of funny to think about these. Like we, most of the names other than Shelton that have ever been nominated, you don't associate too strongly with like one party. But, but you I, know, it is, the it other feels screen- like it's coming. It's only a matter of time. Joe, the other screen is DeSantis touts culture war priorities in Florida speech. So, okay, so you know, we'll there see. you go. It, it's a it's a sign of what's coming. It's only a matter of time. Gina Smilek, thank you so much. Congrats on the book and really appreciate you coming uh, on Odd Lots. Thank you for having me. Tracy, I really enjoyed that conversation. I thought that last point in particular, that like what we've seen with the Supreme Court, because like obviously like, you know, presidents have always appointed more liberal or conservatives, mm -hmm. but also like now you don't expect to get any votes from the other party to, for your nomination, et cetera. Like we haven't quite seen that happen with the Fed yet, but it's almost like, how is it going to avoid right. that fate? It seems highly unlikely to me that this like, very powerful group of technocrats yeah. is somehow going to be immune to the intense politicization that we've seen of literally everything else in the past few years. Um, so that's point one. But I also thought Gina made a really good point about, you know, there is all this criticism of the Fed, often for justified reasons. And to some extent, it has been accumulating all these new powers yeah. and abilities that it hasn't been explicitly designated to have, at least by voters, but also sometimes it's making the tough choices and sometimes there yeah. aren't great outcomes. Yep. No, and, and just this idea, like I keep thinking of it as like, it's independent in the sense that, okay, it's supposed to be sort of immune from partisan politics mm -hmm. and make hard decisions and do the tough thing. And that's an element. But then there's also these sort of like operational independent, one entity in DC that does not have to like, you know, always go up for a vote or come down for re-election or whatever. And as it gets harder and harder to pass anything in D.C., and I don't think many people expect that trajectory to change, then everyone's like, oh, you guys, you guys don't have to worry about the politics that we do. So oh, you're you guys totally right. And I think when you use, I think you were, you use the word uh, sink, yeah. right? It's like a sink for things yep. that can't get done in Washington. And that that is true. And it has been helpful at times. But the more it does that, I yeah. think the more attention it's going to garner and the more the, it becomes a target. Totally. And the more partisan it will become exactly. and the more people will be really focused on, okay, but what is your stance on the Fed's role in funding climate, et cetera? Like these kinds of things, they'll inevitably get more heightened and then you'll have more of those 51, 49 nomination votes and things like that. Yeah. On that happy note, <laughs> shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. Okay. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow Gina on Twitter, Gina Smilek. She's at Gina Smilek. And check out her new book, Limitless. The Federal Reserve takes on a new age of crisis. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post transcripts, Tracy and I blog, and we have a newsletter that comes out every Friday. Go there and sign up. Thanks for listening. <laughs>